morning. Uh, Good morning. My name is Shirley Malcolm, and um, until very recently, I headed education and human resources programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, I think that I need to explain my title because a lot of people might find that confusing, especially if you're from a library community. When you think about impact factor as a librarian, you think about this larger issue of who's reading it, how many, how many citations, and things like this. The way that I mean impact factor in this particular case is talking about the synergy that happens between the nonprofit AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, as the publisher of the journal Science. And I think that it is an important part to look at who the publisher is and what the publisher does and what the publisher stands for. And I'd like to tell you a little bit of that story. But in order to tell you that story, I've got to tell you a little bit about myself. I indicated I'm Shirley Malcolm. Um, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, a long time ago. Uh, and I am a product of the post-Sputnik race for space. And so when I and my colleagues, my classroom colleagues, were in school, we, uh, we went to segregated schools, so there were a lot of people in my class who were interested in science and mathematics. When I graduated from uh, Carver High School in Birmingham in 1963, I went to the University of Washington, which is so different from Carver High School that you can't even begin to imagine. But one of the things that I found at Carver High School that I didn't find at the University of Washington was I lost community at the University of Washington. I didn't find other people who looked like me. And over time, as I have moved through science, I have not found people who look like me. The further you go, the fewer there are, the fewer women, the fewer minorities. And therefore, I guess that it might be a logical thing for me as a science professional after moving away from my faculty, my biology faculty role, to be drawn to an organization to be able to put in place programs that would address larger issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so that's the story I want to tell you about AAAS because I think that it is important to understand who the publisher is. As I said, AAAS is more than a bunch. Um, it is the largest general science organization in the world. It was founded in 1848. Uh, science was founded in 1880 and had no relationship with AAAS until 1900. Uh, the science roots go back to people with few name recognition, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, but in fact, the, it was the alignment with AAAS, I think, that really has been able to hold the brand science over the years, over the generations, um, as we have moved through uh, the, the history of the, of the relationship between the organization and the journals. Uh, AAAS has been very prominent in terms of shaping science in America. That means that when there are agencies or departments that seem to be needed, AAAS was a base for the advocating that some of these things be put in place. And so that's the reason that we want to look at the, at the organization in a very different light. AAAS is an interdisciplinary community, and I think that that's an important part now because so many of the problems that we have, global issues, are in fact interdisciplinary in terms of the way that we approach them. And so while the discipline-based journals have their role in terms of supporting professionals and researchers in those specific areas, AAAS has an opportunity to not only highlight within the journal the important um, areas and breakthroughs, but also to take on some of those thorny interdisciplinary issues that really may not have a home 
And that's one of the ways that can be accomplished through things such as special issues, where you begin to aggregate a lot of the, the concerns into a single document. A part of the AAAS mission has always been about serving society. Uh, and it does this through a number of different programmatic interests, including science diplomacy, education, human rights, and diversity and inclusion. And so that's a little bit of the story that I wanted to tell you. Um, I said that AAAS was founded in 1848, and one of the things that I want you to do is to meet the first woman who was a member of AAAS, and she joined in 1850. This is Mariah Mitchell. And Mariah Mitchell is important not just as like the first woman professional astronomer and the, the fact that she uh, really drove science ambassador and drove science for women, but also this is her 200th anniversary. This is the 200th celebration uh, of Mariah Mitchell. Um, I want to just introduce you to the notion of fellows. We had regular members, but we also had fellows that were established in, 18, in 1874. Uh, this is one of the fellows, Ellen Swallow Richards, uh, who was elected a fellow in 1878. She was the first woman faculty member at MIT. Um, AAAS uh, was this kind of place where it didn't necessarily reach out and embrace other groups, but it put no barriers before them either. And that was different in the science fields in the 1800s. Uh, this is uh, our, a W.E.B. Du Bois is believed to be our first African-American member. He joined in 1900 and was elected a fellow in 1905. And, and Du Bois, most people think of Du Bois as a historian, but actually he's, he's more kind of a sociologist. And, and so in that regard, he would be drawn to an interdisciplinary community such as AAAS. Um, AAAS holds a meeting each year, and this is Ernest Everett Just. Uh, I don't know how many of you may be familiar with the biography of Just that was written by Kenneth Manning, but I, um, I recommend it to you, uh, Black Apollo of Science. He was a prominent biologist and really focused on developmental biology at a time when, where a lot of his ideas might have seemed kind of radical, but quite frankly, they have over time uh, been, been supported, the role of the cell membrane and things like this. But just uh, in his biography, recounts a meeting, a time when he was at the Chicago meeting of AAAS uh, and where he felt community. And that is, I think, a big issue because if you think about the, uh, the 1920, at the time that this happened, uh, it was in all likelihood that he was one of only a few uh, Af African American active researchers who was presenting his work at such a meeting. Um, but all was not always great. You can present in Chicago. It's a little bit different if you present in Atlanta. And there was a, um, a challenge at the 1955 meeting of AAAS in Atlanta, where um, basically you should have known that there was a problem from the fact that there were two different sets of hotels. Mm. All right, and it was the Jim Crow laws that were in play. So it, there was a lot of, um, of turmoil within the organization at that time to go and not to go, to go and not to go. And in this particular case, the anthropologists were totally against going, but Margaret Mead, who was an anthropologist and a leader within AAA, I said, that's fine, let them go, because they need to experience the frustration of Jim Crow. So one of the, I think one of the major pieces that we had uh, within the, the uh, one of the major outcomes of this was uh, Detlef Bach, who is a, uh, was a very famous uh, scientist, uh, president at Hopkins, and head of just about everything that you can imagine, wanted to hear a, wanted to participate in a session that was over at the um, historically black colleges and universities in Atlanta. And 
he couldn't get over there. It was raining, and he tried to get a cab, and the white cabs wouldn't take him, and the black cabs couldn't take him. And so it was that frustration that led to a determination that, in fact, that the organization would not ever again go to the Jim Crow South. And that until there was a, uh, a way for everybody to be to, able to fully participate in all parts of the meeting, that that was just not going to happen. Uh, so in that regard, we have been, over the years, actually challenged to stay within that framework. The first woman president of AAAS was not until the, uh, the early 1970s. She was president-elect in 1969, Mina Reese, a mathematician. Uh, but since then, and the first African-American president was Walter Massey, and he was followed not uh, by another African-American president, uh, Shirley M. Jackson. But since that time, since that breakthrough in 1969, it has been about 40% of all of the presidential leadership has basically been women on minority. And if you look, there will be some times where you see that there is year after year after year after year of women being elected president of the organization, 16, 17, 18, 19. And we finally got a guy <laughs> uh, who will uh, assume the presidency in 2020, uh, Nobel laureate Steve Chu. So it's not like you can't do it. It is the fact that if they are not nominated, then they can't possibly stand for election. And so you have to think about the, those kinds of issues within the structure of the nomination. So it, it has, the organization has gone through any number of, of changes over the years. How do you bring more young people into the organization? How do you bring, um, how do you address the kind of the larger societal issues of the day? Uh, resolutions that focused on women in science and, and providing more access for women in science. The establishment of a committee in an office, which still exists, to try to deal with a lot of these places. And I say the AAAS was a good place for diverse voices. SACNAS, the Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, is rumored to have started in an elevator in 1973 at a AAAS meeting. And I know most of the founders who were in that elevator, and I said, how dare you guys all be in the same elevator together? If anything happened to that elevator, it just wipe out the community. <laughs> but that joke aside, it was really an important moment. And now Sockness is celebrating 45 years. And I think that that is really a, 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 a force to, to be proud of, how do you facilitate and support this kind of, of networking and, and community building. And I can't really say enough about the issue of community building. And I think that that's one of the real challenges that we're going to have going forward. When there's all these different voices that are out there, how do you, in fact, help to frame a space in which community can be built? Uh, we added the issue of the, uh, the, the concerns of scientists and engineers with disabilities in 1975. Um, and also in 1975, really were the first to look at issues that relate to women of color within science. I was at that meeting. I was a part of the early discussions. I was primary author of the report. The major point being that intersectionality is a totally different kind of a thing. How do you, in fact, respond to being both? But people are often surprised. The notion of intersectionality did not arise until much later, but they are often surprised that this, we would have these conversations in 1975. Now, the issues that relate to um, disability, I think that, that that's absolutely crucial. Remember I said that this was 1975? This was below, before any of the major laws were passed that actually related to, to granting rights to persons with disabilities. And, but we managed to find, or we managed to have find us, scientists and engineers with disabilities who in fact said, okay, here are issues that you're dealing with issues related to women, you're dealing with issues related to African Americans or Latinos. We have problems, we have challenges as well, and the organization actually did respond to those challenges. 
one of the major responses is not just about, uh, and I will, uh, one of the major responses is not just about um, um, listening to people, but doing something about it. How do you basically change a meeting in order to have fully accessible? In some cases, remember this is pre-technology, so in some cases it means that you've got to braille your entire program. All right, this was before you might have, you've had voice recognition, you was before a lot of the other things, captioning, that would make it a lot easier to make the meeting accessible. But one of the biggest issues is you had to get into the hotel. So there's a, that's its own story in terms of, of uh, when you're negotiating the meeting space, negotiating for accessible rooms. That's a major piece, which meant that in some cases hotels had to make the rooms accessible because they, they weren't, there weren't any. And I think that we don't realize what, how, how different it was in the 70s with regard to persons with disabilities. Uh, as I indicated, we had a number of resolutions on women in science. Um, we had resolutions that related to Native Americans in science. And this was something that really Margaret Mead cared deeply about because she said that really in order to have Native Americans accept the organization as advocating for, for the tribes and for the, the indigenous populations, that in fact it was crucial that we honor and acknowledge indigenous knowledge. And local knowledge systems were something that was a part of a lot of discussion on, from, from the board so that they could begin to really know and appreciate these, these concerns. The, the concerns about uh, bias don't disappear in the 70s. They keep popping back up, uh, including in 2005 when, uh, with the famous Larry Summers uh, incidents. And now they are basically popping back up around sexual harassment. And we are being challenged, as all organizations are, to really take an affirmative stance with regard to how we prevent sexual harassment in science. Recently, as recent as September, the Council of AAAS approved a policy on revocation of status of elected fellows in cases of proven misconduct, including harassment. And the reason that this is important is that harassment is allowed to flourish in in times when there are no consequences that are attached to. And so as the science community begins to attach consequences, uh, revo revocation of an honor or an award or a fellowship, or in fact, uh, calling into question codes of ethics and including these within codes of ethics, I think that this begins to dampen the, the the behaviors which have been tolerated for too long within, within the science community. Uh, sometimes you're called upon to spend a lot of money to live your values. And in there, this is, these are two cases here. Uh, in, the, uh, in 1978, when AAAS joined the effort to not meet in non-ERA ratified states, you probably don't even remember that we had an effort to pass the Equal Rights Amendment that would focus on women. But in fact, we were scheduled to go to, go to Chicago. Illinois didn't pass it. We got out of Dodge and went to Houston. When, amazingly, Texas had passed it. And so um, in another incident where we had to move a meeting from Colorado, which was getting ready to put in place uh, legislation that related to the rights of, of homosexuals. And that I used the language of that was currency the currency of the language at that time, uh, though that was later overturned in courts. We, in the courts, we moved to Anaheim, moved our meeting to Anaheim. And it's not easy to move something that is that massive. Uh, but in fact, if you don't go into places that where all of your members can't be able to participate, that's the consequences that go along with it. And there, we had to face this fairly recently with Austin. And it was the business community in Austin that felt to pull back the legislation that was being proposed at that time. 
So remember I said that uh, we basically made the 1976 meeting in Boston fully accessible to persons with disabilities. Well, we had a steep learning curve to figure out how to do that, but we didn't want everybody else to have to basically have a steep learning curve, and therefore the staff developed a report called Very Free Meeting. And this was the first time that we, that this such a report existed, and it talked not just about the physical barriers that had to be overcome, but also the social ones. You know, how do you, where do you hold receptions? And how, how do you organize it in such a way that you, everyone can be able to participate? Um, and since that time, every annual meeting has been fully accessible to persons with disabilities. And this was before the legal requirements that this be the case. Uh, we The meetings have been a place to deal with other kinds of large social issues. Remember I said that we had a resolution that dealt with sexual minorities uh, in 1975. Well, guess what? You know, this means that we had a, a platform. We were able to use the meetings as a platform to talk about the issues and discuss what would, should be the response. And that includes the 1980 meeting uh, in San Francisco uh, of homophobia in the workplace. And some of you who may be interested in a uh, piece that I wrote in 1981 uh, that is in science entitled Who Are the Gay Scientists? And it talks about the, the aftermath of, of these kinds of discussions and what happened in terms of science not carrying advertisement where from groups that in fact discriminated on the basis of sexual orientation. So it was, this is what I'm talking about. Even though there is total and complete editorial independence on the part of the journals, there is also this kind of values orientation that moves back and forth uh, across the organization uh, and the journals. Uh, we have looked at legal challenges uh, that, that come up because from time to time we are faced with, what, with decisions of the courts or in decisions uh, that come through legislation that we have to figure out how do we in fact continue to press forward uh, on bringing more diversity into the science and engineering community at the same time that we are challenged legally. And so, the, as I said to, to someone else, the waters are in fact navigable, but you have to be very careful of the sandbars. And we partnered with legal scholars in terms of saying, what can we do that is both programmatically effective, that works, and at the same time is legally defensible? that doesn't get you in trouble. And so we have been doing this work uh, for many years. We work globally as well. Science is a global journal. Well, guess what, AAAS is a, is a global organization. Uh, we worked with uh, um, the Advisory Board of Science and Technology and Development uh, to organize a conference before the Women's Conference in, Mex in uh, Nairobi. Uh, we had a, uh, a delegation in Beijing and in Beijing plus five, all of the different women's conferences. And we've had work that in fact was, that has been uh, international this entire time. This is just out of the unit that I had it. The international office in fact had relationships with different groups all over the world. We worked in science, science education, uh, science for all Americans, uh, was translated not for all Americans, but science for all, uh, was translated into other languages, in Spanish and in Chinese and in Japanese, because this is a statement, as a statement of what it is that everyone should know and be able to do. And this was, in fact, called Project, from Project 2061, because this came in the year that Kelly's Comet came. The idea was that you need to educate students for a time when Haley's Comet comes back. Not backward looking, but forward looking education and educational challenges. Uh, this is a case of where that is more recent, where vision and change 
uh, is a document that tried to bring order to those of us who are members of the disorderly life science community. I tell people, as a biologist, we split by body parts, by function, by species, by everything that you could possibly imagine. But this particular document, we had to bring coherence into the, the life sciences because you cannot hand a freshman a 700 word, a 700 page book and expect for coherence to emerge. And in this particular case, AAAS was the secretariat that helped to bring the life sciences community together totally so that we could begin to say conceptually, what are the big ideas in biology? What are the big ideas that we should be teaching our students? Even though we can teach them at different levels, all the way from the uh, cellular molecular level, all the way to a uh, whole um, ecosystem level, but the ideas remain robust and the ideas go across the community. Uh, science in the classroom is something that I really want to, to talk to you, and this is, and you have cards, uh, this this is a is a partnership between the journal and and the education unit the programs, where they where um, articles journal articles are annotated to enable students like as the undergraduate or advanced high school students or teachers to be able to help them read what seem like impenetrable research, and yet this provides right there as you read it the scroll over that will allow you to kind of make more sense out of what you have. This is a bit where our staff coordinates an interaction with the authors in order to be able to do this and, and uh, make it make the information, the concepts and ideas much more accessible. Um, this is being used by some of the uh, biology, in one case by a biology textbook, although the the articles that are being annotated are not just in the life sciences. They go across the, the different fields, such as those that covered by the, by the journal. AAAS, you mentioned I talked about human rights. AAAS has, works in human rights. Um, we, uh, some of this work is absolutely incredible, and you, it's kind of like the stuff of which movies are made. Uh, I will point to one, this is an example of of where a team of scientists that was assembled by AAAS went to Argentina to teach local uh, forensic scientists excavation techniques that would preserve evidence when these mass graves and that could therefore be admissible in court. Most people have no idea that we would be involved in something like this or to work with people to identify geneticists who could, who could work through the complexity of the genetics and the statistics to be able to demonstrate grand paternity during the time of the disappeared. I mean, young people were the ones who were, who were murdered. But in some cases where there were children who are, or pregnant women, they allowed them to remain and so that they would deliver their children. And then they gave the children to members of the military or supporters of the, of the group at that time. And so families wanted to reclaim the children into their rightful families. But the only way you can do that is to basically do the DNA analysis in such a way. But if there is no other mother or father who's alive, then you've got to basically reconstruct the whole, the whole genetic history here around the issue of can we, the brothers or the grandparents or the, or the cousins or the whatever it is of the, of the families. And so this uh, was supported and this work was, was uh, done by Mary Claire King, who was a famous geneticist, uh, who was the determiner, the discoverer of the BRAC uh, gene. But in this particular case where she was doing this work under the auspices of AAAS, a fluent Spanish speaker, she was also able to testify, which is really uh, a great thing when you're trying to go into the courts. We have programs that support quality science communication. In my unit, the unit that I headed, uh, we had the mass media fellowships, where you take advanced students of, uh, who are um, 
in science or engineering or mathematics, and you you put them into a uh, a, me a media site, newspapers, magazines, uh, radio, TV, and they basically are functioning like press. And a lot of the most famous science journalists really came out of that program. People know Joe Palka? He was a mass media fellow. Or uh, Richard Harris, mass media fellow. There are a lot of people who have come out of it. You may not know that Neil Baer, who was the executive producer of Special Victims Unit, okay, was a mass media fellow. Or Eric Lander, who is continued as head of the Broad Institute. But there is a long line of people, but the notion is communication. How, in fact, do we support communication? We have a new program, new of like 11, 12 years, diverse voices in science journalism. Because we have so many communities that are really not served well in terms of science journalism. And so the idea is can we begin to build the, 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 the pool uh, of talent? Uh, we have a AAA at Subaru SBNF Book Awards. Uh, where we, in fact, look at children's books and have reviews and then there are awards that are provided. And Subaru, this partnership last summer, resulted in 80,000 books that were donated to high need schools. We, the program on um, the dialogue on science, ethics, and religion uh, supports uh, science classes and courses actually being offered in seminaries. Because there's such a, a, a schism in, in so many ways between the religious and the scientific community without their needing to be. Uh, this program looks at invention and innovation and, and tries to promote the idea of invention and innovation, especially to serve, um, to impact the needs of the world and to serve society. Included within, among these uh, individuals is someone by the name of or two people by the name of Steve Sasson, who was the inventor of the digital camera, and Eric Fossum, who developed the CMOS chip, which is the camera on, that allows you to take these pictures. And I, I told them that I want to do a, a piece, and I don't know where I'm going to put it yet, Steve, Eric, and social justice. Because by having this now, it just really has totally changed the kind of conversations that you can have about social justice. And I think that for people to really understand that somebody invents this, someone has to promote it, someone has to push it out, and that in fact it can in fact make a difference in our lives in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. This is a program that I am basically deep into right now called Sea Change. Uh, it is a lead-like certification program for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is targeting colleges and universities. Uh, and the idea is that it will give lead to recognition uh, awards for the institutions or for departments around setting broad diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and trying to do self-assessments and looking to see what might need to be done in order to make a difference and to try to help and encourage and, uh, colleges and universities to make their STEM departments much more diverse, not because of representational issues, but because diversity is the engine of innovation and excellence. And that's why we're trying to push on this. Uh, and so uh, at the end of the day, what we want for the organization is to be a force for science, to be a voice at a time when facts may not matter and evidence <laughs> makes no difference, to try to basically stand up for these larger principles. Of course, you have the journals, but we also have a healthy series of actions and a and staff who can interact with the journals around key issues of the day. And I think that that makes both the organization stronger and the journals stronger. So thank you.